Uh, our next speaker is uh, Steve Kirpin, who is a, uh, uh, has both a dental degree and a master's degree in public health. His medical or his dental degree is from the University of Pennsylvania. He did his periodontal graduate work at uh, Columbia and also received his MPH uh, from Columbia in maternal and child health. Currently, he is in private periodontal practice in uh, Great, no Great Neck, Long Island. His topic today is oral care for the pregnant woman and its implications. Uh, Dr. Kirpin has a dual appointment at North Shore Long Island Jewish Medical Center in both the Department of Medicine and the Department of Obstetrics, which makes me conjure up a rather radical picture of his chair. But anyway, his, uh, he has co-authored articles on oral care during pregnancy with uh, an obstetrician. He coordinates a program for oral care for pregnant women on Long Island. And um, oops, sorry. Uh, with that, we'll turn the program over to Dr. Kirpin, and um, uh, excited to, to see, uh, have him tell us why we should have, think along these lines and what we need to do uh, in our area to help the situation. Steve, please. Anyway, actually, what I, I need to start with a confession. Um, I have to confess to you that I've come here with an agenda, and the agenda is that I would really like all of you to consider treating underserved pregnant women. I want you to do it because um, I think it can be fun. I want you to do it because I think it can be enriching, and I want you to do it because I think I could prove to you that it might even be profitable. In the last year and a half, I've actually cared for over 850 pregnant, underserved pregnant women in my practice, and I can truthfully tell you that it's been the most rewarding experience of my 25 years of private practice. Now, I, I'm sure I have a little bit of uh, a skepticism in the office, so I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned. First, pregnant women aren't kryptonite. You, you don't have to be afraid to treat them. They don't rob us magically of our powers and our abilities. Um, getting too near to them is not really a problem. I've also learned that there are babies inside of those bellies, um, not tiny little malpractice lawyers. You don't have to be afraid of them. Um, you don't have to be worrying about lawsuits all the time. Dr. Kumar and his expert panel has really explained to us already that it's, it's, it's safe to treat them, and indeed we, we must treat them. Um, finally, Pregnant women are not some kind of toxic asset to us. They don't need to be taken over by the Treasury Department. They won't ruin your balance sheets. Uh, if properly motivated, uh, they will show up, because I know that's been a bit of a problem out here. Um, and they can be a productive part of your, uh, your practice. Um, I want to give you a little background uh, about me. I'm a periodontist, and, and my uh, enthusiasm for, for, the, for this problem uh, occurred several years ago uh, when there was some early research associating periodontal disease in preterm babies. Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, pictures of preterm babies because of those octuplets that were born recently, uh, but really, if you, if you ever get to see them up close, they're, they're quite shocking. You could hold them in the, in the palm of your hand. Uh, but I could give you an update on, on two of these kids, uh, the, the cute one right here, right in the middle, and the one all the way to my right, because those are my twins. Uh, they were born 18 years ago. They were 2 pounds, 13 ounces. They were dangerously premature. Um, and uh, they spent the first 10 weeks of their lives in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, but unless being uh, annoying teenagers is somehow associated with being premature, they've actually turned out quite well. But again, you could understand how, how uh, my enthusiasm would be piqued when the yearly uh, research associating periodontal disease in preterm babies uh, came, came about, and I'll spend a little time going through that, that where we stand with that right now. Um, Dr. Uh, Kumar really organized those wonderful guidelines, which are compelling reading, 71 pages of compelling reading. But if you don't want to 
read through all of them. I will spend a little time going through that uh, right now. First of all, why should we treat pregnant women? Um, first of all, uh, improving oral health prevents complications of oral diseases during pregnancy. Um, it can decrease childhood caries. I know you're going to get a great uh, uh, presentation about that, so I won't dwell on it, <clears throat> particularly as a, a periodontist. It may reduce preterm low birth weight babies. Uh, we'll spend a little time on that. Excuse me. <clears throat> and for, ma <clears throat> for many women, it is, uh, <clears throat> this is a great thing to happen now. Excuse me. <clears throat> for many, many women, it's the only time they have dental coverage. Dr. Kumar ha has discussed that as well. And I can tell you in our practice, Basically, we, we, we'll, we'll explore that in, in a little bit, but basically, if they have coverage, they've been to a dentist. If they don't have coverage, they haven't been to a dentist. And we have seen a tremendous amount of patients who have gone their whole lives without a dentist. It's also a teachable moment, and this is something that I really didn't understand until we started treating the pregnant woman, and we learned that they would basically do anything that uh, they're told to do if they think it's going to be a good thing for their baby. Uh, there are certainly effects of pregnancy or, or, on uh, oral health. You get an increase of cavities because of uh, uh, the change in their diet. Um, we've also seen the problem with oral health, of course. Uh, I don't know how many of the women here have been pregnant, but they're, 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 they're not even able to put a toothbrush in their mouth for the first couple of months. Uh, so they're, they're nauseous and they're vomiting and they get sensitive teeth and erosion. And gingivitis, as you, you well know, is a common finding in, in pregnant women. But I'll show you some data for, from our group uh, um, that it's much greater than what you're seeing here. Also, you want to be concerned about loose teeth and restorations because they could interfere with uh, general anesthetic, which could be uh, uh, a problem if there needs to be intubation at delivery. Um, and oral care should be an integral part of prenatal care. Um, this is, you know, when I started looking at my lecture, there's really only about four important things I'm going to say, which isn't so great for an hour, I guess. But the, 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 the coordination and the integration of prenatal care, or prenatal providers and us, is really what will either make this work or make it not work. We've been very fortunate on Long Island to have the enthusiastic support of the prenatal care providers, and I'll try to show you uh, how we tried to accomplish that. Prenatal care providers can be crucial in breaking down barriers to access, um, which are significant. Uh, they can help us dis dispel misconceptions, such as x-rays during pregnancy are harmful to the fetus, and that postponing treatment until after pregnancy is safer for the mother and the fetus. You know, again, we've treated so many of these women, and they're, they're, they're high-risk women, they're, they're immigrants, and it, I, you just develop some, uh, some images. Where so many times women will come in, and the, their face is swollen, you know, there's, there's pus coming out of their mouth, uh, they're in pain, they're on antibiotics, and you say, well, I've got to take an x-ray. Like, oh, I don't want an x-ray. You know, well, if they don't take an x-ray, we can't treat you. Well, I don't want any dental treatment. It's bad for the baby. So there's a lot of obstacles to overcome. Um, the, the state is telling us that deferring appropriate treatment may cause unforeseen harm. Uh, Dr. Kumar also talked about that uh, tragic case, case with women being self-medicated. We do see that all the time in our practice. Uh, untreated cavities may increase caries in children, and we'll talk about oral infections giving a systemic problem. Um, dental care is safe and effective during pregnancy. Again, oral health care should be coordinated amongst prenatal and oral care providers. I'll just reinforce it again. If you got the, the um, prenatal care providers on your side, you can have a very successful practice. Um, first trimester diagnosis and treatment, including needed dental x-rays. And I'm hoping somebody will ask Dr. Kumar uh, at a question and answer session about what needed dental x-rays are, because I always have a, a, a dilemma about that. Uh, they can be taken safely, though, uh, during, uh, uh, um, for immediate treatment, but this isn't the time to be doing a, a lot of your crown and bridge and, I guess, uh, implant type of stuff. But delay in necessary treatment could result in a significant risk to the mother and indirectly to the fetus. Um, this is a, a, a study which is a CDC study. Um, basically, m most pregnant women don't go to see, see the dentist. We know that. They're, they're afraid of uh, us causing harm to the fetus. 
Um, I have gave a lot of lectures to obstetricians, and I was giving a lecture at Stony Brook about a year ago to the uh, OBGYN. It was a grand round. And one of the women, uh, one of the obstetricians raised her hand and said that when she was pregnant, she had two painful cavities, and she couldn't find a dentist who would take care of her. And this is a place that has a dental school. So uh, there is a lack of knowledge, and that's why those guidelines are so wonderful. And we need to, to get the word out uh, to the obstetricians as well. Um, we should encourage, the, the, the guidelines are telling the prenatal care providers that any woman who hasn't had a, den, a dental visit in the last six months should see a dentist. So there's a lot of patients, and most of them really haven't seen a dentist within the last six months. And they should facilitate treatment by providing medical clearance, and we'll talk at length about that. I didn't want to come today without uh, showing you some pictures of teeth and gums as a dental office, so here's one picture. Here, here's, 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 this has got ones with a little more swelling, but the, and the truth is that this is a part of a PowerPoint that I give to obstetricians, and I try to make some jokes. I'll tell them that you know, the oral cavity is easily located, tell them, tell them where it is in relationship to uh, the cervix. And then I'll show them some really you know, advanced periodontal disease to get them all, you know. And then I'll show them a, a really advanced case. And I actually used Dr. Kumar's slide, the, the, uh, the, the, the sole of that, the, the foot, because it really dramatically shows, and I'll say to them, as I'll say to you, is, is that how is it that the oral cavity could be so unique that these kind of infections could have no effect anywhere else on the body? And indeed, we found that uh, there are, I'm sure everybody is aware that chronic periodontal disease has been associated with cardiovascular disease and stroke, diabetes, and COPD. You could add to the list now articles on kidney disease, cancer. And I, I swear to God, in the, uh, a couple of days ago, I did a, a search and I found that there's a, an article associating um, periodontal disease with erectile dysfunction as well. So I, I figure that's going to get my patients flossing a bit, if nothing. <laughs> But, but really, the most significant thing might turn out to be that insurance companies are beginning to look at this stuff. Uh, Aetna, which has been very proactive and very much on our side, uh, did a study where they looked at 116,000 patients who had both dental coverage and medical coverage and who had diabetes and coronary artery disease. And you could see from the, the graph that they found that they could save money by giving them some uh, routine dental treatment, uh, up to 16% uh, savings at the, at the medical end. Uh, th there's also been st something reported, hasn't been, uh, it's been report reported but not published yet, where once again, Aetna looked at pregnant women. And they uh, looked at 29,000 patients, and they saw that having some dental care either before, which is something important we could talk about, or during pregnancy led to a reduction in preterm delivery from 11% to, to 4, 6%. So many of the insurance companies give us a little bit more coverage. Uh, Cigna does it, Aetna does it, and several other companies. Uh, without getting too much into the pathophysiology, we just have to remember that the mouth is full of bacteria. Uh, there is actually more bacteria in the mouth than there are cells in the body. And we don't have a very good way to defend against them. The epithelial attachment is very thin, could be as much as a, a, a one cell thick. And in the presence of inflammation, that bacteria and its associated inflammation can penetrate down into the connective tissue, it can get into the bloodstream, and the bacteria can go downstream, and it causes a systemic inflammation, and the bacteria can go to target organs and cause all sorts of problems that we're really studying now. Um, just keep going here. I just, on this slide, I just want you to, to know that there are certain words being used in the medical literature, cytokines, uh, pro-inflammatory mediators, uh, they talk a lot about prostaglandin E2, interleukin 1 beta, TNF alpha. The idea is that the mouth is being considered kind of a, a, a reservoir or, or even a, uh, an endocrine organ, and uh, bacteria is always getting into the bloodstream, which is kind of part of the reason why we changed the endocarditis regimen. It seemed foolish to be giving patients antibiotics just because they are coming to the dentist when they're getting uh, showered with bacteria every time they eat and every time they brush their teeth. So that's part of the reason why, why we don't do that anymore. Um, 
in terms of uh, public health um, dollars spent, prematurity is a huge problem. Um, I'm quoting $17.2 billion, um, but I've seen it up to $26 billion being spent for babies who were born prematurely. I can only tell you that 18 years ago, I drove up to my mailbox, and my kids were still in the intensive care unit, and I got an envelope. It was a Friday afternoon, so I couldn't call anybody. And it was from Mount Sinai Hospital where they were, and I opened it up, and they said, Dr. Kirpin, uh, the insurance company has paid X amount of money, and the remaining $657,000 is your responsibility. Uh, and they were very nice. They gave me a remittance envelope. They said I could use my American Express card. Um, but I could imagine that, that those kids were probably the buy of the century compared to what it probably costs now. And it's an ongoing problem. Um, the, we're talking about these children costing an extra $20,000 per year per child um, because of the associated neurological problems and pulmonary disease that they develop. I mean, it's a bad thing. But what's really kind of depressing is that even in America, which is you know, the land of medical miracles, the rate of preterm delivery, they're not doing nearly as well as Dr. Kumar is with, with carriers. Um, it's actually increased over the last 20 years. And um, this is a slide I got from one of my obstetrician friends. And you can see how it's gone up from 9.6 to 12.3 in 2003. And they had done similar projections in hoping by the year 2010 it would be at 7.6%, but it continues to rise. But there's a point in the pregnancy where they really, where things really begin to turn around. So from 23 weeks to 20 weeks, remember a baby's born usually at 40 weeks, and at 37 weeks it's considered premature. But those early babies are the really dangerous ones. And um, if you could get a baby up to 25 weeks, you see the survival rate goes from 29% to 71%. So you can understand why the obstetricians are, are, are very interested in any intervention that is safe and that could help them even a little bit. Uh, they figure it's worth trying, particularly because at this time they have very few tools to, for prevention and, and treatment. Um, I want to make it clear that w there's a big difference between association and, um, and, and, and cause and effect, because I think it gets muddled in, in the media a little bit, and that's probably our fault. Um, we know that periodontal disease is associated with preterm delivery. Um, Dr. Jeff Code at University of Pennsylvania showed us that if a woman had periodontal disease, she was seven times more likely to deliver prematurely, those really little ones, before 32 weeks. Uh, Dr. Offenbacher at UNC uh, showed us that if a woman had moderate to severe periodontal disease, they were 11 times more likely to give babies, give birth to babies that were the size of my kids. Um, some early intervention studies were, 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 were uh, uh, quite promising. Uh, again, doc, Dr. Jeffcoat, who just stepped down as dean, dean at Penn, um, she was able to reduce preterm babe delivery uh, from 6% to less than 1% by doing some scaling and root planning during pregnancy. And, the, and some nice studies out of, uh, of Santiago, Chile, uh, showed that um, if they had a group of women with periodontal disease, if you gave them treatment, uh, you could reduce per their preterm delivery to less than 2% from, from 10%. However, the pendulum seems to be going in the other direction right now. Um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, it was an NIH uh, study, 823 women, uh, again, you could see, failed to demonstrate a significant difference between control and treatment group. I got to tell you, the study designs of some of these NIH studies are, I, I, as a private practitioner, I don't totally understand, I'm not an academic. But in this group, the, the control group was see the, the troop that didn't receive treatment, they were seen every month for scale, for, for polishing and home care instruction. If they had bad teeth, they took them out. If they had periodontal disease getting worse, they treated it. So what, what happened by the end is both the control group and the treatment group got better from the periodontal standpoint. So I'm, again, I, I'm not saying that the results are wrong, but I don't understand it, how to use it in my practice. Uh, same kind of thing with, with Dr. Offenbacher. This hasn't been, uh, um, published yet, but it was reported that, the, again, an NIH study, 1,800 patients, they said that the tr our pr treatment did not reduce prematurity. 
the protocol, again, to me, didn't make sense as a practitioner. They were, every patient received one treatment of scaling and root planning and had no follow-up visits, which to me was kind of like treating a diabetic with a dose of insulin and saying, what, what effect is that going to have four months from now? So 40% of the untreated mothers, the ones who didn't get any periodontal care at all, got worse, but 30% of the treated mothers got worse. So in this particular study, everybody seemed to get worse periodontally. So I'm not really sure what they're telling us. So I don't know how relevant these are to my life yet, uh, but uh, I, did, I knew I was coming down here, so I called Dr. Jeffcoat, who is doing a, a third study on this, and she, while well, she's getting similar data, she said that there seems to be a subgroup of women with advanced periodontal disease who the scaling and root cleaning uh, did seem to, to be statistically helpful in preventing preterm babies. She also thought that the, the, the need thousands of patients to really get a good study going. And she also thinks that the next stage is going to be uh, really looking at cost effectiveness and trying to save money at the other end. But the good news is that we, what we do, we know is safe. And um, uh, let's get this. We, we, most of the treatment that we do is done by uh, an ancillary staff, the hygienist. I know there's a lot of hygienists in the audience, and I'm happy. Um, when we talk to our prenatal care people, we want to make it very clear that we're not going to be hurting their patients. I mean, that's kind of the number one thing we got to get, the, of course, get them, get them through the fear. And we tell them that just about everything we do could be done without a local anesthetic. And hopefully you all could recognize the difference between the and a, before and after. But the point is that we know we could get predictable results. But I know as a clinician, and you people know as clinician, so that's not going to happen in one visit. And unless you do a lot of intensive oral hygiene instruction, a couple of weeks or months later, it's all going to be back to where it was before. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. I want to just touch on some of the uh, things that are kind of nitty-gritty stuff. You're, I, I think you've all heard a bit about the, uh, the guidelines already, or you could refer to it. But ba basically, current evidence says that there's no increased risk regarding congenital malformations, growth retardation, or abortion from ionizing radiations at doses less than 5 rad. So x-rays seem to be safe. Uh, we should be using our clinical judgment um, and use protective collars, of course. Um, th this is kind of interesting. Many people are kind of surprised that we, we lidocaine with epinephrine is considered safe, while mepivacaine is considered riskier. Um, I'm always getting a, re a referral form from the obstetrics people who cross out the epinephrine, um, who I think, like the cardiologists, are kind of thinking we're using doses that are much higher than what we're using. Um, nitrous oxide is, is, is risky because it can lead to hypoxia, hypotension. Uh, and there's a risk of of aspiration and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I'm aspirating. <laughs> and there is um, <clears throat> an alteration in the therapeutic dose. Uh, it's safe to use mercury rest restorations according to the state, and they also give you this uh, really very useful um, um, boxes that tell you what, what antibiotics are safe, the penicillins, amoxicillin, cephalosporins are good. Of course, stay away from tetracycline and some of these other ones. It's safe to use acetaminophen and codeine. Um, <clears throat> even though th th this slide says uh, uh, that it's safe to use the NSAIDs, uh, I've had a lot of obstetricians say, why don't you just stay, you stay away from them if you can. And it's not safe to use aspirin. Uh, there is a proper way to, 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 uh, to put these people into the chair. Um, put them in a, a flat position because the, um, the, the fetus could put pressure on the infino, uh, inferior vena cava, which could lead to um, uh, hypoxia and, uh, uh, and, and hypotension. So we always want to keep the head ab above the feet, and we're very meticulous about that. I'm going to skip this slide because I know I think you'll see something like that later. Uh, this is my favorite slide. I, I love this slide because this is what makes me sleep at night. Uh, when I began to consider starting this program, um, my wife would start yelling at me and say, what are you doing this for? You know, we're going to lose our house. You know, <laughs> something's going to happen. You know, so um, I, I called up the, uh, the, uh, uh, my malpractice covered, and, and I assumed they would say, oh, we know about the guidelines. Uh, uh, we give you 100% support. I think what you're doing is great. And I got, well, well, I'll get back to you on that. And, uh, 
about a week or so later, I got a, a letter from them that they will cover everything that I'm doing, but they really stress that we get clearance and that we be uh, meticulous in our uh, documentation. So th this has two parts to it. It gives us the clearance, which I will not do a patient, um, treat a patient without. without. Um, but it also has a bottom part, which I think is very important. It's a report back to the prenatal care providers. Uh, you know, I think we're trying to bring dentistry to a level where we're going to be doing a lot of stuff with medicine. And if we're just going to do this and not act like we're obstetrician, excuse, like we're a cardiologist or ophthalmologist, and we just take it, they, they w take this very seriously. They want a, re a report back. They're following up on their patients. And we have to tell them our opinion. So it really is a two-way street. We're going to play in the big leagues. I think we have to play, play appropriately. Um, we try to reinforce the things that the obstetricians are telling them. We know that when you're pregnant, you shouldn't smoke or use alcohol. So we want them to reinforce the things that they're saying, that we're saying, and we try to do the same for them. And again, uh, those radiographs. Uh, I, I, just a moment about my, my impressions about obstetricians. Um, I have found the interactions to have been just wonderful. They're, they're very receptive. They're very respectful of the things that we want to do. Um, the, any kind of feeling of medicine and dentistry being on different planes, I, I've never experienced that. Um, they're open to new strategies. Uh, they're very aware of the guidelines uh, because now they're beginning to think, you know, if they don't send a patient out that they might be uh, uh, sued as opposed to uh, ignoring those guidelines. Uh, the cooperative, they also have an interesting perspective on these studies that on on uh, preterm babies and periodontal disease. You know, they don't have that many things that have really been effective, but the ones that they do know are effective took decades of conflicting data before they felt comfortable that it was really working. So every time I get a, a, one of these articles come out, I call them up, they say, just give it time, you know. Um, but in, indeed, what they do have to do for us is pretty easy. They just have to give us a referral form. Um, what we have to do is a little bit more difficult now. I mean, I think we're looking at a situation where the, the, uh, New York State is telling us to, to take more responsibility. Um, we might have a little bit more liability when we treat, but we're going to have a liability if we refuse to treat. Uh, the financial incentives I'm going to touch, touch on shortly, but you know, we're not going to be doing major uh, treatment. We do have a, a moral responsibility. Uh, and I think this is the first of many opportunities to, to integrate uh, our profession with medicine. With that as a, a kind of a wordy background, I want to s spend the next, um, oh, we're doing well, next 25 minutes or so um, on the program that we developed in, in Long Island. So I asked a question, is it possible to provide oral care to an underserved group of pregnant women? Um, is it possible to implement the goals of the um, Department of Health? And then can this be done in a private practice setting? You, you know, I think a little bit about, th there was this bank robber, uh, Willie Sutton, and they asked him why he robbed banks. And he said, because that's where the money is. And I think it's kind of the same thing. If we want to make a, a dent in this public uh, health problem, I mean, this is, we're, we're all in private practice. Most, I don't know what the statistics are, but most dentists are in private practice. So that's where the dentists are. Um, so we did a project where we partnered uh, a, my private practice, fee-for-service periodontal practice, with two hospital-based Article 21 programs. So th those are basically uh, teaching hospital programs at North Shore and LIJ. Um, we wanted to overcome some significant barriers, okay, cultural mores. I, I'll give you a little scene setting. I, I practice in Great Neck, which is a very affluent, uh, cushy, um, suburban area you know, on Long Island. Uh, but it is very close to, to the eastern part of Queens. And Queens has really become a, kind of like a kaleidoscope of nationalities and Im immigrants. It's a very interesting culture. But uh, when these women come in, they have a very to say, it's uh, a nice way of putting it, a low dental IQ. And trying to get them to, to come in and be taken, be taken care of, it, we have a lot of obstacles to overcome. There are knowledge gaps, which we talked about, but there's also some reimbursement issues. Um, our target population is something called the PCAP program. I, I don't know if that's something that's used up here, but it's, I guess it's like the WIC program. Moms, okay. 
Okay. So basically, the idea of it is to decrease the incidence of poor pregnancy outcomes. There's a whole bunch of these patients. Um, they offer comprehensive obstetric care in these beautiful clinics. Um, they have obstetrics, obstetricians, social workers, nutritionists, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and now they even have a periodontist. And um, it's, it's aimed at a very diverse, multicultural, high-risk population of women. There's a whole bunch of them, as you can see. Um, and what we decided at the get-go was that we wanted all the patients to be referred to the, our private practice. And uh, th that we had a little trouble with that because I think they were looking at this traditionally as being like an emergency clinic. But if we were going to incorporate what Dr. Kumar was putting down in the guidelines, uh, we didn't want this to be an emergency clinic. We wanted to do some good preventive care. We do an examination uh, and oral care screening, and I think in this population with the uh, HPV uh, situation associated with oral cancer, I think that's important. We take those necessary radiographs. Um, we make a diagnosis. We do intensive oral care instruction. And this is probably where I think we're making the biggest changes, we think, on their quality of life. So we spend a lot of time reviewing oral ho home care. Uh, we treat periodontal disease if necessary. We appointment th reappoint them throughout. If they come in with an active infection or they have pain, we send them to the dental clinics where they take care of them regardless of their financial reimbursement. But the biggest problem that I've developed and I, I've encountered, and I'd love to have some kind of interaction later if we can, is that we have not met their dental needs. I'm a periodontist, but we have not been able to identify dentists in our community downstate to offer comprehensive care. And the main reason is because these patients are being seen before they have coverage. That's the appropriate time to, to start intervening in prenatal care. Um, so often patient, the uh, payments are delayed or often denied because we have a big managed care situation, which I don't think is a, a bigger problem here, but I just can't get a dentist to take care, care of these people. Um, in order to begin a program, if you're hopefully so inclined, we identified appropriate hospitals and administrators. This was rather easy because the, um, the state has begun to put pressure on some of these PCAP programs to provide dental care. So when they heard that I was interested, they actually sought me out. Uh, we had meetings, uh, um, and we start by giving lectures like this. Um, we have given several to grand rounds to uh, attendings and residents, but the most important thing that we do is outreach to the nursing staff, the midwives, nurse practitioners, the PAs. Um, this is the other, one of the other important points I, I, I'm going to make, is that this is where the rubber meets the road as far as I'm concerned. If you have the enthusiastic support of the people who are actually delivering the care, it will work. And if you don't, no matter what the, 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 uh, the, uh, the doctors are telling their staff, it's not going to happen. We also spend a lot of time with the financial administrators because we want to get paid. Um, uh, can I skip some of this? Private practice makes the appointment. I will make, spend a minute or two claiming the virtues of, um, of uh, capitalism. Um, what happens in our programs, we get a referral form, and then we take, get the forms and we call each patient, not once, not twice, but three times in order to get an, uh, to make an appointment. We call them the night before. We call them the day of the appointment because a lot of these women have cell phones and they might be on the wrong bus. So we're putting a tremendous amount of energy to do the right thing. But we're also doing the right thing because we want to make a profit. And what I do in my office is I give my staff some incentive to make this happen. Um, and they become financial incentives, I mean. They become stakeholders or shareholders, whatever you want to call it. And I, it really is a, one of the reasons why they're committed and why it really does work. Um, we go over home care. We, we, I think strategies to reduce caries transmission will be discussed later. Uh, we encourage postpartum patients to come back, and that's when we take a full mass series of x-rays because they still have some care, some uh, um, insurance for another month or two afterwards, and we offer anticipating, anticipatory guidance for children's oral health. Um, we've had some successes. Again, a year and a half, maybe a little bit longer, we've seen 850 patients. And not just screenings. We've actually taken care of these people. 
we gave grand rounds, we've had a, a, an interdisciplinary conference, but I think the most important thing is that we've managed to make the, the hospitals uh, understand that they should give oral health a high priority, the highest priority. At the very first visit, both the social worker and the, and the uh, nurses get, go over why these patients should s come to our office. And they follow it up. If they don't, if they go, it's almost like they need a dental note. They don't really need it, but they follow it up and they want to make sure that they came. So I think we've proven that underserved population can be integrated into a private practice setting. I think we've overcome institutional resistance, which is not so easy uh, when you have a big place like that. But I also wanted to spend one minute kind of praising my, my own private practice population. Uh, again, I was very reluctant to, to get into this. I got a lot of warnings. Uh, this is, I've always had a typical uh, affluent population, kind of a, gets out of hand sometimes, but mostly fairly quiet. And all of a sudden, this group comes in. You know, they don't come by themselves. They come with three other kids and their mother and their grandmother and the crazy outfits. And you know, it, it's becomes it's become a very wacky practice. But um, with the exception of one woman who gave me a warning that she didn't think this was going to be good for my reputation, um, my my private practice population has been very accepting. And maybe it's because their patients are pregnant. But I, I'm very very proud of them. I'm also very proud of the patients that we're seeing. Um, you, you know, they, in my mind, they've, they're getting a bad rap. I mean, these women have been motivated, they've been appreciative, they've been receptive to what we have to do for them. Uh, some of these women will come an hour and a half, take three buses in a, in a snowstorm to come visit us. I won't say that the cancellation rate is non-existent, but it really has not been a, a major issue. I think we've been able to transform attitudes towards oral care in this population, which is, again, I think an important goal of the state. I think that many of these behavioral changes will be for a lifetime, um, as I see them calling us up after they give birth to, to, to come in for postpartum visits. And I think it's happened because of the strong bonds that we've developed with the, the hygienists. I mean, this is really going to be something that I'm appealing to the hygienists and the, the dental assistants. They, they developed um, very close relationships, of maternal sometimes, or sisterly relationships with the patients. And we have a consistent message that's coming from both us and from the prenatal care providers. Uh, <clears throat> I think we've truly been able to integrate uh, medicine and dentistry. We've been able to elevate the perception of dental care amongst the uh, medical staff. <clears throat> Uh, yet there are some challenges that are significant. Um, the, there's a Medicaid conundrum. It, it seems that the money, for now at least, is available. Uh, the need has certainly been established, uh, and the obstetrics community understands and is supportive. But because we have to see these patients before they have coverage, um, we're not getting the, the dentist to, to get on board. Um, and then, of course, there's that historical historic uh, resistance of dentists to treat and the resistance of patients to treat care that we're having, you know, we'll always have a problem getting at. Uh, reimbursement is time consuming and, and it's, while it's less than fee for service, it's really not all that bad, I think, unless you get into a uh, managed care situation. Um, again, there's a lack of dentists to treat underserved risk population and there's a movement, I know some people are hoping that they could extend the amount of time that a woman has coverage beyond two months to try to address some of their needs. Um, finally, I just want to uh, report to you a little bit about uh, some uh, data that we, we generated from my practice. Um, we wanted to ascertain the oral needs of the PCAP population. Um, we wanted to evaluate the efficacy of providing this care in a private practice setting. So we decided to take a six-month period and look at um, consecutive charts. It turned out to be 300 consecutive charts. Uh, we got a prenatal care periodontal risk um, assessment form that the Department of Health uh, helped us uh, create. But uh, somebody had to sit down and look at all those charts. And you know, I don't know if it's true up here, but downstate, a lot of high school kids have to have community service in order to graduate. So I have uh, a kid at home who needs that, and he also wanted me to buy him a car. So I made him sit down and look at all these, arduously look at these uh, charts. And we did come up with some interesting data that I think so anyway. 
we knew that gingivitis was going to be very prevalent in this population. We know that it's prevalent in, in any uh, population of pregnant women. But we, I was a little shocked at how few of these uh, patients came with healthy uh, gingiva, less than 40 percent, no, less than 40, not forget 40 percent. And a tremendous amount of them had the more advanced forms of periodontal disease. And again, I, I think back to what Dr. Jeffcoat just said to me, that she thinks there is a group with the advanced periodontal disease that seems to benefit from periodontal care. Um, so only 12.5 percent were healthy, 48 percent had more advanced form, and I think it's safe to say that this population has an extraordinarily high incidence of periodontal disease. Uh, we looked at when they went to the dentist last, you know, because the Department of Health is saying that any patient who hasn't seen a dentist in the last six months should go, to, go for an examination. And my feeling was that that wasn't going to be many people of this population. And indeed, only a handful had seen a dentist. And I think part of that group just didn't want to tell the truth about it, were embarrassed. And part of them just went to, to get a tooth out. You know, I mean, it's not what we're talking about. But if you look how many of these women, it's really quite shocking when you, when you we see it in, in your practice, how many had never seen a dentist or had, hadn't seen a dentist between five years and never. Uh, so only 7% had oral health visits in the last six months, 42% had not seen a dentist for two years, and 26% of these women had never seen a dentist. Uh, we also looked at the uh, number of weeks that the pa patients were pregnant when they got to us. Um, you see, we, we saw women th all throughout their pregnancy, not just during that second trimester. Even women are referred to us 30 to 4, 38, four weeks. We even see patients with, with 38 weeks. Um, for those, we have a very uh, uh, um, conservative treatment plan. We basically just pray they won't give birth in my chair. Um, but, I, I, but the fact that we've, we've seen so many come early, 37% came during their first trimester, um, I think that speaks well to how good the prenatal care providers have been about getting them to us and how, um, how good we've been about getting them in in a timely fashion. Finally, the number of visits that uh, these patients have received from us. Again, I know that some hospital programs have tried to do this, and, and some, many communities have tried, um, but they're just doing screenings. We've actually gotten uh, <clears throat> women to come back. I thought I'd get through this with, with almost hip. <clears throat> We've... Um, <clears throat> We've uh, got, gotten them to come back for multiple visits, um, two, three, four, four times. Uh, so we've really been able to motivate them to get comprehensive care, not, not just a screening. Um, but it's interesting, we, we didn't do a, a risk, a carriage risk assessment, but we did find that 17% of them required emergency referral for either pain or infection or both. So I feel confident when I can make the conclusion that there's a dire need for oral care in this at-risk population. I think that access to oral care in this group has been greatly inadequate, but they can be successfully motivated to seek appropriate and timely care. So um, I basically, boy, I finished fast. Um, it, I, if anybody is motivated enough to want to put their toe in the water and want to uh, start a program, um, I'd be happy to uh, to, to uh, give you any support. My office manager, Barbara Hine, came with me, and she knows all the, the nuts and bolts of trying to negotiate the, uh, the Byzantine uh, Medicaid uh, system. Um, but we're, we're here as, a, as a, uh, a source for you, and thank you for your attention. The, the, I'll have Dr. Kumar add as well, but the, the guidelines do say during the second trimester that you could use it for one or two days. And, well, the same doses that you would use under normal circumstances. You don't really have to make any adjustments. You know, people would ask me, do you have to premedicate women for because they're pregnant? Like, you do all the same things. The only thing is I've had some some of the obstetricians say that they've had problems with uh, birth defects because of the, uh, the NSAIDs. So they said rather than just use it one or two days, just try to do without it, particularly when we have codeine and, and, uh, and acetaminophen as an appropriate 
medicines as well, to use. What are the, what are the problems that they're afraid of? Uh, what are the up here next year. Let, last week we talked and I, I said, I've got to talk to you like a, an old friend, so can we become uh, classmates? <laughs> and we had to be very frank with each other. Uh, it, the, the program in, uh, uh, instead of being PCAP, in Steuben and Chemung County is a program called MOMS. And they can give presumptive coverage, in other words, on the form that we used in Shimon County, they actually check this patient is going to have Medicaid. They can tell by the, the data they have. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that uh, you two can correct me on this, but the, the study that was done on x-ray, one of the problems with the study on x-ray is that it appeared in the American Medical Journal, and it was done in Seattle and it was a retrospective study, it's not a good article in my opinion. But what it did is that it took mothers, it took all mothers that were on Medicaid for a long period of time and did a retrospective study that said this mother had a prematurity, did she have any x-rays done? They found no problems as Dr. Kerbin said, up to the amount of five, what we used to call rentcrins, which they now call grays, for reasons I don't understand either. But anyway, what they said at that period of time is, so in other words, um, I think four bite wings are like three point something, 3.2 grays, I think. And actually, a panorex is even less than that. I think it's just, it's, it's three. Uh, so you, I mean, you can take uh, four bite wings, or if you want, one panorex without even blinking an eye, without any problem at all. Now, where the, the uh, problem that comes up is that out of no factual information at all, they said, we think the people that had problems had problems because the x-ray hit the thyroid. Nothing factual. So you better use a collar because when the physician, if he ever looks up that article, he's going to say, do you use a collar? And the answer is yes. There's no reason not to. But there really, I mean, there is, he, I mean, he, they didn't do any thyroid function test. And it's just, it was pulled out of the sky. The last thing I want to say before we go to lunch is that it's nice to find out that a retired oral surgeon equals one teenager who wants a car, because that's who did the data collection in, in Shimon County. They're, they're, it's very similar. I don't have to buy your car, right? No, not at all. Any, any other questions? Uh,